A simple problem. Suppose you could determine the level of pollution allowed this year. Where would you set the limit? We are frequently made aware of the dangers of lots of pollution. But would it also be a mistake to have too little? No, this isn't some denial video about how a warmer Earth is a happier Earth. Obviously, a zero emission world is desirable. But are we ready for that yet? Imagine that, from tomorrow, everyone on the planet simultaneously began using only green energy sources, and that all conventional methods of transport, heating, lighting, and anything else requiring the burning of fossil fuels must be surrendered. The short supply and extreme demand for the remaining energy would make it impossible for all but the richest in society to afford. The rest of us would be left with a collapsed economy, the end of the world. Over time, technology may allow us to get very close to an emission-free world, but a working economy is needed for this development. When making such huge decisions about the future of our world, we cannot afford to be in the dark about the costs of reducing pollution. Determining how we can best use our emission budget is more than just an issue of climate science. Such a big problem requires a multidisciplinary solution. Even combining science, economics, politics, ethics and sociology, for some issues, extreme uncertainties mean we can only produce answers at the level of an educated guess. Now imagine that you, the chooser of pollution, capable of saving humanity from climate change, must consider what is the most efficient way to reduce pollution. Here, efficiency or cost effectiveness means getting the most bang for your buck. How can we get the most output for a limited input? We need to balance the cost and effectiveness of each measure. This is the speciality of economics. Some climate change activists ignore economics as a useful tool, claiming the problem is too significant for money to be a concern. However, this reality-defying idea holds back progress. By recognising the limited amount of money available, economics can guide us to prioritise the most effective spending. Many people are still unable to see past ideas of economics as self-interested profit maximisation. These people are understandably sceptical of the free market forces that brought about this mess in the first place. But what can you do? Well, on your own, maybe not so much. Choosing to live a sustainable lifestyle is great, but not enough people do so for it to change the course of the climate. It seems a structural change is needed, the kind that requires government involvement. We can aid this by staying educated on climate policies and prioritising environmental issues through our voting. More actively, we can help educate others keeping the environment under the spotlight and lobby our government to focus on climate change, making them more accountable. Regardless of whether we think politicians want to do what's best for the people, or more cynically, just want power, democracy keeps it in their best interest to pursue policies that keep the people happy. What should we expect from governments? While promoting more research through the allocation of public money helps reduce the cost of clean technologies, as well as aiding in the discovery of new ones. Reducing support for emission-intensive industries encourages greater innovation and cleaner practices. Further, making fossil fuels more expensive through an emission trading scheme or a carbon tax utilises a company's desire to lower its costs to reduce emissions. And sometimes it can be appropriate to ban emissions of certain substances entirely, as was the case with CFCs that produced a huge hole in the ozone layer. But making these decisions is not easy. In an economist's ideal world, where taxes still exist, efficiency would be our primary concern. But the world is messy. Different countries have different abilities to pay and have released different levels of emissions, leading to different levels of responsibility. Efficiency must be balanced with justice or equity. For example, the most efficient places to introduce cleaner technology are the developing countries that are not driven by large fossil fuel dependent industrial sectors. These countries face a choice. They could follow the same fossil fuel based path as today's developed nations or follow a more expensive but also sustainable development path centred on green technology. However, precisely because these countries are less developed, they have the least responsibility for the emission problem and the least money for an expensive solution. While a system which encourages the rich to pay for cleaner technologies in other countries may be the answer, organising it adds another dimension to the complexity. The international agreements that are vital for this global coordination often yield suboptimal results as some countries have more to bargain with than others. More than just a cliched answer to an interview question, climate change can be seen as an opportunity rather than a problem. An opportunity to create a world based on greater interaction and respect between countries. 
it is not a stretch to believe that a world which can make its economy sustainable could also find solutions to other global problems, such as the extreme inequality between nations. However, the dreamy nature of the solution also indicates much about the difficulty of the task at hand, and perhaps how unlikely a solution may be. Yet the consequences of getting this wrong are catastrophic. Too little action causes the destruction of the planet. And while there is an interesting question about whether the world would be a better place without humans to enjoy it, the economics of climate change selfishly focuses on the interests of humanity.